Why? Well, because if I organize my behavior properly and I make the right sacrifices, God will smile on me in the future, or at least the probability seems enhanced. It's like, okay, well, we don't use the same terminology. Well, we use the same terminology. We don't burn rabbits, you know, but then again, we're not agriculturalists. So the people who were playing with the idea of sacrifice, like they were acting out the discovery of time. You can give up something now. Try to get a bone from a dog and tell him you're going to give him two bones. It's like he doesn't give a damn about that. Bone now. You know, and we regard the civilized person as the person who's capable of deferring gratification. Deferring gratification is a sacrifice. Does it please God? Well, everyone thinks so, or they wouldn't do it. So, you burn the sacrifice. Why? Well, God's in heaven. How else is he going to figure out the quality of your sacrifice? Well, you might say, well, that's primitive. It's like, don't be so sure. It's like they got the sacrifice idea right. They got the awe part right. Like they're acting it out. It's concretized. It's like a drama. Does that make it primitive? Well, no, it's not primitive. It's unbelievably sophisticated. It's ridiculously sophisticated. Because the, the mode in the Old Testament is you make the right sacrifices and you will thrive. Do we believe that? Yeah, it's the basis of civilized behavior. You don't get a complex civilization without that presupposition. Um, so I think, I think we've, we've actually done quite well. Good, good. It's hard to keep to a linear track, eh? Exactly. This is another problem with this kind of material. It's like Jung called that the process of coming to terms with this material a circumambulation, a continual wandering around a center, you know? And you sort of specify the center by, almost by inference. So it's, it's, it's one of the things that make Jung very difficult to read. Because everything that he says is dependent on all the other things he said. That's one of the problems I ran into when I was writing Maps of Meaning too. It's like, there's a presupposition at the bottom that you have to accept in order to follow the logic. And the presupposition is, there are alternative ways of laying out your initial presuppositions about the nature of reality. It's like, well, why should I accept that? Well, I can't show you why till you accept it, because I can't walk you through the argument. It's a paradigm problem, fundamentally. So, so the way I did that in Maps of Meaning was that it was kind of like a small circle to begin with, and then a bigger circle, and then a bigger circle, and you know, so I could get all the elements described in a simple way, and then make it a little more complex, and then a little more complex. And that seemed to work to some degree, anyways. And there's, a, there's something, I mean, not to be sycophantic, but there's something so compelling about it, I think largely in part because that basic presupposition is not articulated well or even accepted in the, the, the sorts of science or social science that we learn in university. Well, that's partly why it's so shallow. The social science in particular, it's like, man, it's, it's unbelievable. This, like, I, I should be careful about that. I learned a lot from animal experimentalists, a lot and from neuroscientists, but most of the ones working on animals. They, they learn things, and, and part of that was a consequence of behaviorism, which was, you know, a very reductionistic um, method, useful, you know. So it's like, it's not like I dismiss the capacity of science to produce useful information, it's like, but I'm also terrified of it. You know, it's like, well, there's no reason to be so optimistic about scientific truth. You know, the other thing that, that I've noticed about the, the rationalists, or the, the empiricists, you know, they're sort of off in the same corner, is that they always make the assumption that if we transcend our historical religions, we'll no longer be religious, and what we will be is rational. It's like, I think, no, no, you're, you're completely out of your cotton pick in mind if you think that. It's like, well, how do you account for the emergence of New Age philosophy? It's like, if you want incoherent, just take a wander through that desert. It's like you blow out these historically, this, these carefully constructed historical frameworks. What you get is like rampant and insane Protestantism. The idea that people will magically become like Newton because we've blown out the substructure of our morality. Like <laughs> that's, so, that's so absurd that that's the sort of thought that I think is motivated. It's like there's a reason to believe that because who the hell would believe that? It's just you, you don't know anything about people if you believe that. People are, it's hard to think scientifically. It's really hard. 
here's a way of thinking too. You could think, you can reduce religion to, to sort of Darwinian principles and sort of destroy it that way, you know. Or you can expand your notion of Darwinism so that it actually encompasses the genuine phenomena of religion. Man, that is way more interesting. But the problem is, it's also the problem, the reason that people won't read Jung. First, he's very difficult. Second, he is terrifying. It's terrifying to read Jung. So, well, because, I mean, no one thinks like, like he thought. Nobody thinks like that. I mean, he, his grasp of the development of ideas stretched over, like I said, 10,000 years. It, it, it puts the Enlightenment thinkers to shame. But, but the, if you start grappling seriously with the idea that ideas have people instead of people having ideas, that forces you to reevaluate the entire nature of your being. Because the other thing he asked is, which ideas have you? And where are they where where are they suggesting that you go? And like that's like the Greek god idea, right? We're playthings of the gods. It's like, well, Daw Dawkin already Dawkins already knows about memes. These are like meta memes. And so let's not be too incautious about who's in control here. So it's like, okay, well, you've developed a nihilistic philosophy that's predicated on rationalism. Fine. Why? Who's behind that precisely? You? It's like, yeah, right. No way. A thousand other people wouldn't think exactly the same way if it was you. You're just in its grip. And what's it up to? The, it's up for the betterment of humanity. Sure, maybe. But, you know, I wouldn't bet my life on it. When Jung wrote about alchemy, which, you know, his writings on alchemy are incredibly opaque, but I, I can give you a bit of an insight into them. You, you can understand Jung's writings on alchemy if you start from the presupposition that the matter that alchemists were studying wasn't matter, it was information. Now, you know, the relationship between matter and information is very complex. And some people think the substrate of things is information and ma matter is sort of an emergent property. Whatever, it's complicated. Now, if you're studying information, you can't study it objectively, precisely. Because as you study the information, you get informed. That changes you. And so the problem with studying this sort of thing is that you can't study it without being changed. Because if you're not changed by studying it, you're not studying it. It's not, you're no anthropologist who's outside of this. You can't be. Because if you're outside of it, you don't understand it. Because if you understand it, then you're not the same person anymore. So you, you can't keep it at bay. And so that's also partly why Jung is terrifying. You know, there's this, I read, and I don't remember where, you know, there's the crucifix has Latin letters on the top of it. And it's I-N-R-I. It means it's, it's the representation of Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. Hypothetically, that was put on his cross. Um, there's an occult interpretation of that, which is also Latin, which I can't remember. But it means all nature is renewed by fire. And so the, the crucifixion then is assimilated to the idea of a forest fire. Everything burns down before there's new growth. If you study religion properly, it will demolish your personality. Your personality, like the personality that's you, is like the dead branches on a, on a pine tree. It's like you might be clinging to them because you think, well, I'm all these dead branches. It's like, well, yeah, but first of all, you should let go of them. And second, you should let them burn off. And then you might think, well, I don't want them to burn off because that's me. It's like, yeah, that's true. But it's, it's the false you that you're clinging to. Well, that doesn't mean you want to be burned up in the flames. So to study this material properly is to be burned up in the flames. And there's no escaping that. You're just not in it if, you're, if that doesn't happen. You don't get it. Like one of the things I realized when I started studying this was that virtually everything I said was a lie. I would say 99%, and by lie I mean it was manipulative, it was unclear, it was vague, and that was all often motivated, or it was a false attempt to gain dominant status, which is typical of someone who's intellectual. It's like, well, I've got these ideas, I've taken them from places, and now I can use them as, say, status weapons, something like that, which is what people do when they're trying to win an argument, say. It's like, that's all lies. 
It's like, well, that's rough when it's 99% of what you say. First of all, the first thing you realize is how much you aren't. You're not Nietzsche. You know, you're, you have your experience as your claim to reality, and it's often pretty thin. But, but the development of authentic speech is worth the price that you have to pay for it. So, but you just can't stay detached from this. This isn't a phenomenon to study. It's like the basis of, it's the basis of being. So, so. on that note, because that's, that's, that's uh, an expression of your experience really delving in depth.